What's up, glorious, glorified community? Omar here back again with a brand new episode of The Path to Glory. We're kicking off 2021 with a bang. That's right. Today, we have a super cool guest that I'm super excited to have on our podcast. And in fact, I've been following him for almost five years now, and I picked up so much value uh, in the early days and all the way up until now. It's just unbelievable. So I'm really, really excited and honored to you know introduce our guest today, none other than Philip Van Dusen. Philip Van Dusen is the CEO of Verhul Brand Design, a brand strategy design and marketing agency based in the USA. He has over 20 years experience in strategic branding and graphic design, and he has worked for some of the world's most successful and global companies and branding agencies. Philip shares his expertise in marketing, design, entrepreneurship with his 200,000 subscriber following on YouTube and in the top brand industry newsletter, Brand Muse. He's also the creator of the Brand Design Masters podcast, uh, which leads the Brand Design Masters uh, Guild, a series of exclusive mastermind groups and hosts the Brand Design Masters Group on Facebook. In his career, Philip has served as a VP of design for both PepsiCo and Old Navy and as an executive creative director at the iconic branding firm Landor Associates. His past clients include P&G, Kraft Foods, Coca-Cola, Merck Petsmark, and Safeway, Chevron, Levi's, Microsoft, Campbell's, and Johnson & Johnson. That's a lot of big names. Wow, you know that's that's an impressive portfolio and uh, you know history of uh, of clients that you've worked with. It's just absolutely stunning. Um, welcome, Philip. It's so exciting to have someone that I've respected as a design and entrepreneur, uh, you know, for a long time now on the podcast. How are you doing today? Uh, and yeah, what's going on? I'm doing great, Omar. Thanks so much. That was quite the uh, introduction, and so thank you for that. It's a pleasure yeah, to be here. Well, absolutely. It's most deserving to, to be honest. And uh, I mean, we can kick off this discussion by, you know, we'd love to do this in the path of glory. The, the, the whole idea behind the path of glory podcast is to see, you know, we're, we're believers that in this digital age, everyone is an entrepreneur in their own right. Doesn't matter what industry you're working in, whether it's design, marketing, paid ads in the path of glory, we'd love to hear about your background story. You know, what led you to where you are now as a designer, as an entrepreneur? Sure. I'm going to keep this the total Cliff Notes version because I don't want to just go on and on. But essentially, I started off as a fine artist, actually. I have my master's degree in painting. And I um, early on in my career, I started my own t-shirt company and then moved into working for a number of other apparel companies and realized very quickly that um, being a creative director was a lot like being a teacher, which is what I initially wanted to be in fine art. And um, I really just absolutely loved it. And being in the apparel industry and doing t-shirt graphic design on, on for t-shirts was as close to fine art as you can get in kind of being in the, the product world. And so it was a, it was a tough, but an interesting transition. And so I spent about 15 years in the fashion industry and um, worked my way up through a number of companies until I was, you know, at a very senior level at old Navy. Um, one of the great things about being in that, um, role was that I got to travel the world uh, looking for trend um, about three times a year for over a decade and traveled, you know, to London and Paris and Milan and all of those fantastic places. And that's where I really got my kind of um, my passion for finding trend and also my eye for it. Um, after I was, um, I moved out of the fashion industry and into the branding design world and um started at a firm in San Francisco doing a lot of consumer packaged goods and brand identity and brand strategy. And um, then eventually made a jump to another agency, Landor, as you mentioned, and uh, worked with P&G and a lot of other you know, giant corporations. Um, and then after a few more years, I made the jump back to the client side and um, took up a, a role as um, Mauro Percini was building design as a competency inside of PepsiCo. I um, took a role as the VP of Global Snacks, which is basically overseeing like all of Pepsi's killer snacks, which is like Fritos and Delete Doritos and Lay's potato chips and just like all those good for you foods that we all know and love. And that was like, that was totally fun and amazing. And, um, and then uh, 
I, I, I hit a wall after about 25 years of, you know, really working 80 hour weeks and, and uh, working with gigantic clients, I kind of burned out and I started to wonder whether I really liked what I was doing anymore. And um, I decided to take some time off. So I, I, I walked away and took a year off and really kind of rethought and reconfigured what I wanted to do. And that's when I decided to go off on my own and start my own brain consultancy. So I started Verhal Brand Design um, and I made a concerted decision not to work with the Fortune 100 anymore. Um, I really wanted to work with small and medium-sized companies and entrepreneurs because that's what I was really excited about um, in building my own brand through content marketing and um, through speaking and podcasting. Um, I realized how much I didn't know, essentially. I'd been working at a very, very senior level for decades, and I realized how much I didn't know about entrepreneurship, digital entrepreneurship. And so I had to learn all that kind of stuff from absolute scratch very late in my career. And um, I loved it. I mean, I love learning. I'm super passionate about it. And um, I just kind of, I, I took off, I, I caught fire. And um, whenever I learned something new or whenever I had a success, I passed that on to my clients. And that's what I'm still doing. I'm kind of um, helping small to medium-sized businesses do branding, brand strategy, design. I do a lot of uh, coaching and mentoring of creative professionals and entrepreneurs as well. And I've built, you know, over the last four or five years, a pretty significant kind of community on a, at a lot of different levels um, through the teaching and the and the content sharing that I've been doing. So that's kind of the that's the the quick version. Well, that's awesome. I think you know you've done full circle in terms of the whole digital entrepreneurship ecosystem. You know, finding your uh, sort of uh, your zone of genius, then creating a community around that. Uh, what's interesting about your journey is that it's like you said, you were working on a senior level for some of these top brands that we all love and respect, yet your growth, your level of growth, you, I mean, you weren't satisfied with your level of growth and you discovered more opportunities there, right? And so you had to take a step back and, and look into that. Would you say that's kind of because like a lot of designers, you know, working in an industry, even at the top level, they're kind of seen as you know, sort of the the traditional way of looking at designers are seeing them as designers, just the people that hold the paintbrush or the, or the, uh, or, 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 you know, has, uh, you know, do, does the creative fairy work on the side mm -hmm. and gets a pat on the head and, and gets pushed to a room in the corner to do what he does best uh, versus actually becoming problem solvers and uh, people that bring significant value to the growth of the business through design solution. Would you say that's the case? Um, I think that is a perfect characterization of exactly what is happening. And I think it's also a description of the problem. The problem in that most, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a graphic designer and working in an agency or in an in-house corporate environment and, you know, doing your design and loving it and making a living. You know, I, there's nothing wrong with that. The thing that, um, but there are a lot of people who freelance on the side or they eventually will want to go off on their own. And the more you center your whole existence, your whole creative existence around the company that you work for, the, the more precarious position you're putting yourself in because companies have mass layoffs. There are hits to the economy. Gosh, look at COVID. Um, they... Um, Agencies regularly lay off huge groups of people if they lose a client or they hire new people if they gain a client. And so it's a very uh, insecure environment. And so you have to be very careful about putting all your eggs in that one basket of the employer that you work for. The other thing about it is that you start to develop your own personal identity so completely around just the company or agency that you work for that if that thing goes away, you suddenly feel very exposed and you kind of lose your sense of identity. So that's why um, I strongly advocate that people develop some sort of a personal brand presence outside of the company or agency that they work for because it is an insurance policy. The other thing about it these days is that companies and agencies both really value people who have personal brands. They, hi they hire and look for people who have presences and ideas and do content and will pay them more 
and value them more. Um, so that's another reason why people should really, um, their designers and creatives should really concentrate on trying to grow and own more, grow and own more of their own brand ecosystem, something that uh, their companies and their employers uh, can't touch. And then there's one other thing, Omar, that I really wanted to mention around this was that design has, because of, you know, the digitization of design and how literally anyone with the Adobe Creative Suite and or Canva can create something that looks halfway decent, you know. And so design has been commoditized people are having a much more difficult time commanding the prices for just basic design work than they used to. It's not like your mom with Canva or Pinterest can't like throw something together that looks serviceable for a social media post. And so that has also created a lot of downward pricing pressure on creatives in general. The other aspect of that is the, you know, the developing world and how, there are just now with the internet, you can source a designer in the Philippines or in India or in Asia or the, you, you know, anywhere and get design for pennies on the dollar. And in many cases, it is very, very good work. So you have to um, also develop that muscle as you were talking about that thinking muscle, the, the understanding of business muscle, the strategic muscle um, in what you do in order to act as career insurance for yourself. So that's, that is my mission in life right now is to, is to, uh, to equip creative professionals with the skills and the knowledge to bulletproof their careers. I think that's a, a really kind of noble um, path that you've chosen, which, which is great. And I think it's really important that creatives learn this stuff as much as possible, especially like you said, uh, with the current atmosphere and, you know, economies becoming globalized, opportunities becoming all globalized. So really it does come down to, you know, how much value you can bring into, into the current digital age uh, or businesses. I think are flocking towards the digital opportunity, especially with COVID. Um, I had a podcast with an e-com entrepreneur recently uh, and, you know, his claim is that um, through research and, you know, everything that's been said on the media is that e-commerce skipped 10 years, you know, and that alone gives a lot of designers like ourselves opportunities to solve major design problems that need, you know, powerful solutions so that they can come online and, and live online, and have a powerful presence there. Um, so the opportunity is there, but they just need that education and learning and the handholding through that process. Um, it's great that you're doing that. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, I mean, I'd like to know a little bit about, I mean, there's two things that uh, my, my intention this in this um, discussion I wanted to touch on is a little bit about how can designers position themselves, um, you know, regardless of what tool they use, you know, what is the, 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 you know, how they, can they position themselves as an authority and what's the process for that? And the other thing is you mentioned content is being a fundamental pillar for you to create that insurance policy. Like you said, um, I think that goes for any business, even, even, even if you're running a business, it's good to have a, you know, a personal profile that, you know, kind of can, can vouch for you for this, you know, this, this, um, you know, array of, of, you know, variety of valuable content that you push out as an entrepreneur that kind of speaks on behalf of you. Right. Um, and I'm trying to do that. I mean, I run a business, but I'm very eager to push content about myself so people can understand what I can do, what, what I've done and, you know, my connections, my network, uh, and what kind of value I can provide. Right. Uh, and also I think, would you say the fundamental core of, uh, and yeah, let's kick this, the next part off with content. Would you say, I mean, what's the intention behind content? Do you go in it with the intention of creating value and having fun producing content or do you create, do you go into, do you go into it with the mindset of trying to create leverage that insurance policy? Um, or is that a kind of a output or a, uh, yeah, a secondary output of doing content? Yeah. The, I think the secondary output is the insurance policy piece of it. I think what you're doing is creating a body of work that right. will help other people. I think your, your primary focus and intention in creating any kind of content has to be providing value to other people. If you're going out of the gate thinking I'm pro 
I'm developing content in order to promote myself, no one's going to read your content. <laughs> no one's going to really care because what's going to happen is that's what's going to show through. It's very easy to see through self-serving content. And so you really have to go out knowing who you were speaking to and what kind of value that you can offer them to help them and communicate that to them. You have to tell them, you have to help them self-identify of who you are talking to and what it is that you're going to be helping them do. And so that's got to be the, the basic, you know, the foundation of the, of the content that you do. And one of the things that I try to kind of, uh, guide people on is that a lot of people, especially who are fairly junior in their careers or who don't have 20 years of experience, they say to this themselves, they, they don't have the confidence to develop content. It, it frightens them. They're terrified by it, putting out a video or writing even a blog post. They think, you know, what do I know? What do I have to teach? I'm not an absolute expert. One of the things I try to tell them is that even if you're right out of school, there is someone who is two steps behind you who needs to know what you know. There's someone in high school who wants to get into college or just got out of college and, you know, is, is looking for that first job and you're in your first job. How can you help them kind of position themselves or give some, them some information that would help them along the way? So if you take that mindset of I'm going to help the person who's two or three steps behind me, no matter where you are in your career journey, you have something to offer people. Yeah, the I totally other thing agree that, with you there. Yeah, yeah, and the other thing, and the other thing you want to do, kind of right out of the gate, is you want to have a point of view. A lot of people also, are, you know, they they take the easy road and they will just kind of regurgitate some sort of branding or marketing or design information that they've read or you know looked at somewhere else. The problem is, is that the marketplace in content has gotten incredibly. Uh, it's loud, <laughs> loud, yeah. loud, busy. You know, the feed is running a million miles a minute. It's very easy to disappear. But what is important to do is develop whatever your point of view is. What do you have to say? What do you really passionately believe in? And put a stake in the ground and stand for something. Because, and there is danger in that because whenever you stand for something, someone is not going to like it. Someone's going to have the other opinion. Someone is it's going like to- It's like a strong position basically in- Yeah. But the yeah. thing is, is that if everyone absolutely loves everything you do, you're doing something wrong. That's, yeah, absolutely. That's my opinion. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. I mean, you need to have some bad press if, I mean, if you're not, if you're not bringing, uh, uh, you know, quote unquote haters or hecklers to your content, then you're not- producing or positioning your content well enough uh, or well, having at a, least, at having least a position. developing, pushing, you know, kind of um, encouraging debate in, encouraging healthy debate and exchange of ideas. I think that's really what it's about. I don't think anyone wants to invite haters. It's not fun. <laughs> I've, had, I've had my own. Probably not. Um, yeah, but um, but it, being a milk toast or not having a, you know a point of view is a recipe for being ignored. Okay, that makes total sense, and, and I like how you put it there. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, it goes well to say that being sincere in the content that you produce and having a strong position. So it's almost like your position in the subject matter is about this wide, but it's like a mile deep, right? In, in what you're speaking about. And so the, there's a lot of, uh, context to one little, uh, position that you hold strongly on. And, and I guess, does that become like a mantra, would you say throughout all your content or it keeps propping up this kind of, uh, it's almost, and is this a niche? Would you say that this is this, this focus that you have on or position is not just the subject or topic, but a niche or a, uh, uh, a overarching topic um, throughout the con that's seen throughout all of your content? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that when anyone is starting doing content, they generally are if they are earlier in their careers, they're going to have more knowledge about a particular niche. So they're going to have more deep knowledge around a narrower, you know, kind of range of subjects. I've had a very long career and a lot of experience on a lot of different levels. So I have a very kind of generalist, broader understanding of a lot of things that are also pretty deep. So I don't niche down as much um, in terms of the content that I cover, but I do focus my, you know, my avatar, my, my customer avatar pretty narrowly in terms of where people are in their careers or what it is that they're, you know, needing to know or do in order to succeed. Um, 
something that I wanted to mention in terms of content marketing that I think is really important another and uh, also in terms of people who are just starting off and doing it is that a lot of people think that they have to be perfect. They have to be perfect out of the gate. And they and that's what keeps them from starting. They don't want to start a YouTube channel because they, you know, aren't happy with how they look on video or their production values or, you know, their channel artwork or, you know, their microphone or their lighting or whatever that is, or even a blog post. They, you know, say, say I can't write 5,000 words and, you know, have a bunch of backlinks and all sorts of stuff. It's intimidating. Yeah. And what I tell people is that you really, really just have to start and you have to, and this is one of the mantras that you have probably heard me say on video, which is dare to suck. You really have to dare to, you know, be bad at the beginning because mm -hmm. everybody is bad at the beginning. I challenge anybody who starts doing YouTube or writing blog posts or whatever, doing podcasts to publish their first 25 or 50 of those things and then go back and listen to the first one. Oh yeah. And not it's, realize it's painful. That <laughs> and not realize they've improved. Right. And Very so true. number one, you know, just start. Number two, don't think that you have to write war and peace the first time out of the gate, right? Start with little snackable content. Here's the thing. Most people's appetite for consuming content is, is hors d'oeuvre size anyway, right? No one's eating a 13 course meal. Getting someone to read a 5,000 word blog post is, is a big order because people are time starved and they just want a quick hit of some value and they're going to move on. So it's better to put out more content that is more snackable then it is, you know, one piece a month that is like this tome. Um, so that's another kind of yeah. little. Well, what does what your co content calendar look like then at the moment? Uh, Mine? I mean, yeah. I mean, if, if that's something you could share. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, I can share it, but it's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have, a, number one, I have, a, I have a marketing team who helps repurpose a lot of my content. Okay. So content repurposing is also a very, very important thing. Like if you do a blog post, well, let's start with video. So I generally put out a video every week. I've put out a video every week for five years on Monday. Yeah. Just in the last couple of months, I've had to kind of slow down on that because I'm working on a course, um, my first course, which we can talk about actually, because it fits right into what your next subject theme is, I think. And so I've, um, I've slowed down on that, but I've been putting out a video every week. But then when you take that video, you can take the audio, you can publish it as a podcast. You can take that, you can transcribe that video and you can publish it as an article. You can take, you know, small little video and audio snippets of that and turn those into audiograms and post them on LinkedIn or Instagram. There are a million ways for you to repurpose just a piece of video content. And so I have a marketing team who takes my videos and, and kind of repurposes it across a whole broad range of platforms. Yeah. So when you said, you know, what is your content mark, you know, publishing calendar, it's pretty extreme, but when it comes right down to it, the key pieces of the content that I put out are a video once a week, generally yeah. a podcast. Once You're a killing week. multiple birds. And with... once every two weeks I put out a newsletter and okay. then I throw in a few lives going live in my Facebook group or on YouTube and most of my content cascades from those things. Right. So that makes sense. Um, so you're kind of using video as your basis and then deriving more, further more content through the video, which is similar to what we do, which, which uh, you know, we could totally appreciate. Now, producing content is really exhausting. I mean, I know this firsthand. So, uh, and I appreciate that you have a team to help you with that. And I'm guessing that even the editing down to uh, the distribution and stuff is handled for you in that case. Um, so, I mean, I, my video say? editing is handled by others, but I, I write it. I make the slides, I record it myself, of course. you know, that alone so. is exhausting that, that, that alone, yeah, it is. Is exactly, <laughs> you know, just, just setting up, like doing this here is, is exhausting. Yeah. I, I know it took me a couple, you know, it took me about 20 minutes, but it, it, it you know, it still is exhausting just to get the right setup, uh, you know, get motivated to come on camera and uh, it, it's, it's all you know, it all does uh, take on uh, take on a toll on you. So I'm just curious to understand, like, what would you say to those people just kicking off? You did mention start slow and just put stuff out there. But uh, let's say someone's got a role in producing content, but then they just start to feel that weekly pressure of like, okay, you know what? I have to produce another video next week because I've got this date that I've that I always push push out content on this date. 
uh, on YouTube and I don't want to mess up the YouTube algorithm. So like, what would you say to that individual? That is a, probably one of the most important decisions that you make. Okay. When you start producing content is you have to make a commitment to consistency, whatever that commitment of consistency is, is kind of up to you. But when I started my, I, I first started with my newsletter and I had a friend of mine, a colleague who was putting out a newsletter and I really loved it. And I said, I'm going to put out a newsletter. I'm going to put one out every week. And he did his every other week. And he said, I would, you might want to think about putting it out every week because that week rolls around really quickly. <laughs> and I was like, huh? Okay. So I decided to do it every two weeks. Well, that's interesting. And so I put out a newsletter every two weeks for about six months. And, you know, after the first few months, you start to realize, wow, that two weeks rolls around very quickly. Yeah. But I got in the groove of that idea generation kind of um, mindset. And that's when I just started to, decided to start my YouTube channel. And I said, when I started my YouTube channel, I said, I'm going to post a video every Monday for a year and I'm going to treat it like a job. And if I don't publish it, I get fired. And I published a video every Monday for a year and I never hit, I never missed a, a date. Um, I, it took me about six months to realize I should batch. So I started writing and recording and editing four at a time. So then I could, you know, schedule out the four rest to of go month. out in a month rather than doing that whole process every week, which is what I did for the first six months I did it. Um, and you have to make that commitment. Because right. here's the thing, to build an audience, what you're doing is you're setting up a relationship between you and your audience. You are saying, I'm going to give you value and I'm going to do it regularly because that's what's going to make them like you for what you constantly give them and anticipate that you're going to provide something to them fairly regularly. And so you have, to, and then they will follow you. They will subscribe. They will, you know, to your newsletter, they will, you know, hit, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button on, on YouTube. And until you start providing regular, consistent content to people, they're not going to sign up to you. So right. you really have to, as if you want them to sign up to you, you have to sign up to them. And that's kind of what establishing consistency of delivery in content is. It's, it's a reciprocal relationship. Right. And every, uh, have you found that, um, you know, through the years at any point, did you have like a dry spell of ideas of what type of content to push out or does it just oh, flow yeah. naturally? Of course. Yes. No, so how of do, course how you, you do. Get inspired when that happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I am a, I am a, um, a student of, you know, I've, Oh, I always am looking for inspiration. Even when I know that I don't have a deadline, even when I know that I don't have something that I produce, I am constantly looking for that bit of inspiration. And what I do, I'm totally old school. I have a Google sheet that I keep open as a tab in Chrome all the time. And when I come across a blog post or an image on Pinterest or some news story in the New York times that kind of sparks an idea for me of something I'd like to do something on or a video I'd like to produce or some sort of theme or an idea. Um, I'll throw it into that Google sheet. And so I, and I am constantly populating that. So I've got like a backlog of like 400 or 500 ideas at this point. And right. then I'll look at them. I'll say, Oh, well, what are the four I want to do, you know, this month? And those will rise to the top and the rest kind of fall to the bottom, but I'm constantly, constantly adding to it. And one of the things, you know, you have to remember is that, yes, there are new things, you know, there are new things, new topics, new ideas, new apps under the sun, right? But then there's also a lot of stuff that is not new. And what's really important is like, what is your take on it? What is your point of view? What is the stand that you take on this particular theme? You might read an article or blog post by someone on brand strategy, right? And then they're saying something that you're, and you're like, I should do an article on brand strategy. But when I, I'm not going to copy this person's post, but what I am going to do is I'm going to take it as inspiration and say, okay, what's my point of view on this? How would I approach that subject? What is my special sauce when it comes to brand strategy? And that's what I'm going to share. So I will look to other content producers, other people who are in our world in creative, you know, design and, and entrepreneurship and social media and marketing. And I'll look to them for see what they're doing and I'll do my, I'll do my version of it. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I mean, there are, 
you know, there are only so many topics in branding and marketing and design that you can write and talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but what you can do is take that topic and say, okay, I'm going to talk about brand strategy, but I'm going to talk about it to people who are just out of college. Or yeah. I'm going to talk about it who people who are late career, who are senior designer, who want to make the jump to creative director. Yeah. And then you take that topic and you target your point of view and what you're communicating to that particular avatar, to that person. And that's what makes it unique. And that's what makes it super valuable to that person. And that's how you get followers and subscribers is when you give targeted, helpful content to people who are in a very specific, specific, as we say in the branding industry, need state. They yeah. are in a, they are in a, they are in a place where they need something. They need some information. Needs need some value. They need that thing that's going to take them to the next level. Yeah. And if you can provide that in a very targeted way, where they really feel like, oh my gosh, I am the perfect recipient yeah. of this information. Yeah. Then that's where you're. That's where you lock people in. Well, that's actually funny enough how I found you because I was looking for brand strategy. I wanted to position myself amongst my clients, amongst my network as not just a designer, a person with a pen and a, and a MacBook that comes to the office and gets pushed to a corner <laughs> yeah. uh, and get, gets, gets them to create stuff. Um, and I, I appreciated that content because it allowed me to understand, okay, you know, how can you spin the conversation and come from... Uh, a, a more uh, uh, authoritative position on how you talk and express and elo eloquently express what uh, the design uh, goal should be, you know, for, for a business. And, and that, that was really, really helpful. Um, we spoke a lot about content and I want to make sure we, 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 we continue with that because I think uh, you've done phenomenally well with building your brand presence through content, mm -hmm. but I want to kind of now touch on brand strategy a little bit, just because we're on the topic now. Um, and let's talk about brand strategy when it comes to creating perhaps your, um, you, you mentioned obviously take creating targeted content towards uh, a specific customer avatar. You know, what are the steps you think, like someone just starting out in, in, in creating content around their business, uh, whatever that business might be, whether it's an e-commerce business, uh, marketing agency, design agency, you know, I think any business today in 2021 needs to be online, have an online presence with, with a load of content uh, that is relevant to their target market, right? But how, how can someone use brand strategy to discover what kind of content they need to produce? Well, brand strategy is essentially establishing who you are, what you offer, who you offer it to, how you're better, and how you're different. That is basic brand positioning. And so anybody, an individual freelancer, all the way up to PepsiCo or Coca-Cola or Ford Motor Company has to establish those understandings. And so brand strategy is basically kind of recognizing, deciding, and codifying those things. And so we need to do that for ourselves. What are we offering? Who are we offering it to? Why are we better and why we're different? But then also, as we decide on what content we're developing, that content is subservient of that positioning, meaning the content that you produce has to be for those people. It has to be around those products and services that you are interested or selling. And you have to pay attention to how you're better than your competitors and how you are different or what your point of view or particular brand differentiation is. All of those things are basically the deciders of how you develop content. And any company that hasn't gone through and done basic brand strategy around the tenants of their business is doing themselves a disservice because essentially what they're doing is they're throwing darts at the wall without putting up a... a, a a dartboard first, right? They're just throwing things out there, hoping that they're going to get some sort of attraction or interest or, or attention when they, uh, when they are not being very targeted about what they're doing. And I, I see this all the time with small to medium sized businesses in terms of content is that they, they think, Oh, I've got to be developing content. I'm going to do a bunch of videos. I'm going to do a bunch of Twitter posts. I'm going to do a bunch of Instagram posts, but they're just, there's no focus there's no intention. There's no real clear idea of what the action is that they're trying to foment, what, they, what the decision is they're trying to generate in their 
customer target. And so they're, they're spinning their wheels and spending a lot of money and time and resources in producing stuff that is doing nothing for them. And in many cases, it's actually working against them because it's, commu- it's confusing the people who are coming across their content as to what they really do or are or are for. And so understanding what brand strategy is, doing that sort of work for your company or for yourself when you're developing content is critical because it's what's going to drive what it is that you do. Yeah. I guess it's a it's a global framework, whether it's for your personal brand or whether it's for your business or any yeah. kind of, um, you know, personality you want to derive from content or a product or service, um, brand strategy is a great template or framework to, to utilize, to, to discover the, you know, what it is and why is it, who's it for, what, why does it exist and, and what, what it, what it is exactly. Right. And that's the whole reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Cause when I left big corporate, big agency world, I, I realized that everything that I'd been doing for these giant corporations was a, a basic framework that you could scale down and use for an individual, for a personal brand, for a tiny mom and pop bagel shop. And all you had to do was kind of take some of these strategic tools and methods and techniques and scale them down. And there are, you know, these giant corporations are paying tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars to do this sort of work for themselves because they can pay these giant agencies to do it. But I said to myself, if I can figure out a way to scale down these processes and make it really comprehensible by an individual designer or small agency or a a small consultant, that they could do that work for their clients. Number one, their clients are going to do better in their businesses. And also, and this is the key thing, Omar, that we were talking about before, which is that it's going to give that creative professional a a way to sell their thinking a way to sell a higher level of deliverable to their client where they are becoming a true business partner and not just a design monkey, yeah. not just a mouse pusher. Cause that is, that is where people bulletproof their careers when yeah. they go from mouse pusher and, you know, something where it's just based on subjective aesthetics yeah. and being a business partner where you are being valued much more highly because of the way you think and how you're guiding your clients to success. And that's what, I, that's what I've done for myself in architecting my own offering for my clients. But that's also what I am teaching now other creative professionals how to do. And I'm, as I said, I'm just starting, I'm launching my first course in February called Brand Yeah, Strategy. tell us about it, please. I'd sure. love to hear. Sure, it's, um, it's called Brand Strategy 101 with Philip Van Dusen. And I'm going to be teaching the basics of brand strategy, some of the key basic strategic tools, processes, and ways to go about selling in strategy to small to medium-sized businesses. That's really exciting. And and also, and this is the really important part, because this is the feedback that I get all the time, which is like, my clients don't want to pay for strategy, right? They don't understand what strategy is. And so one key part of this uh, course is going to be Um, how to describe and how to communicate the ROI, the return on investment of strategy and how to sell it in. It's going to be an eight week course. I'm going to actually deliver it live. It's not going to be video. So I'm going to be delivering it live once um, every week. There's going to be a private Facebook group for people to ask questions and for me to um, do, um, you know, kind of um, ask me anything type of lives. Um, and then there's also going to be a tremendous amount of, of handouts, worksheets, checklists that you can download as you go through the course. Yeah. I mean, this is really exciting, uh, Philip, just because uh, in our audience, we have a lot of uh, freelance designers, agencies, and marketing agencies. Now, another segment of our audience base is uh, e-com entrepreneurs. So everyone, anyone listening, you guys are relevant here. So all those who are selling on Shopify and uh, you know, trying to create uh, uh, boutique type e-com products and sell them, um, uh, sell them online. I mean, what would you say to the, will they find value in this course? Uh, for Absolutely. That? Absolutely. Awesome. See, that's the thing. I mean, it, to go through the course and, and learn these tools, how you use them and what they're used for, you can be a creative professional consultant, small agency and do this for your clients. But then also entrepreneurs, you can do it for yourself. 
And that's, that's the other part of it is that you don't have to pay a consultant or, or an agency, you know, 10 or 20 or $50,000 to do this for you. You can look at these tools, learn how to use them and, you know, get a group of people together. Or even if it's just you and you're a solo printer, go through and take and do some of these exercises to clarify what your business is about, what your positioning is, what your mission is. Um, and establishing, you will learn more about how to build a business by going through this course and you can learn how to do some of these kind of key things for yourself. The other thing about it is that later on in your career, your company grows, you go to work for a competitor, whatever that is, your knowledge base in this is going to broaden your vocabulary and being a really excellent um, business partner to other people tremendously. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I found this myself. Uh, I've got a partner in my business for, for Glorify and uh, he's sort of the business head of the company. I've come from a design background and the knowledge I've accumulated for brand strategy is probably the most empowering um, you know, uh, skill set that I have to spearhead that side of the business, you know, exactly. uh, it's, it's super valuable because we know throughout all our brand assets, through all of our content, uh, down from the website, down to the product, uh, and even the communication with our audience, there's a very consistent flow and theme behind the messaging behind that and down to the visuals, of course. And, and that all is derived from this this, um, uh, you know, this understanding of how to execute a well-crafted brand strategy. I'm really excited that you're doing that course, uh, Philip. And, and I totally agree that, uh, you know, I, I can see how, you know, founders themselves can be using this, th th these processes in their own businesses to come up and formulate a great brand strategy behind that. That then becomes like a, I guess, a template for them in their business that they can hold an asset, if you will, once they start to scale and they, bring on more creative professionals in their business. They can just simply, you know, they don't have to have spend, uh, you know, three hour meetings trying to sell the vision of the company to them, but they just, they can literally just sell them one PDF that goes through the entire process uh, and then follow up with a call. And, you know, they're probably already onboarded into the entire vision uh, of the company, um, which I think is really cool. Um, you mentioned like, uh, you know, there's a lot of tools that they'll be utilizing to to formulate. When you say tools, do they? Do you mean like do they have to go on Photoshop and uh, no. and stuff like that? What do you mean exactly by tools? No, no, no. What I mean are frameworks. There are okay. some specific exercises and frameworks that you populate with information um, that are are tools that are used by some of the largest and most successful global branding agencies in the world. Um, there are a huge range of tools that are used in those sorts of situations, depending on a client's needs or what, whether it's a brand or a service or whatever that they're doing or the scale of that company. But what I've done is I've taken a small selection of those tools and created the course around how those particular tools are used and utilized in a process like this. And the thing about it is that you don't have to use all of them. You can use just a couple if you want. A lot of times it depends so you don't on need any specialized skill set, just to be clear here, no. to, to go through this process. Okay, no. cool. No, you don't. And that's the beautiful thing about it. One of the things you were saying, Omar, that I think is really important for people to understand, and I'm really glad you brought it up, was when you were talking about you have a partner in your business and he's the business marketing head guy and you're the designer creative head guy, right? That's right. One of the things that has always held creative professionals back in their careers is that they're there. I, I like to use the analogy of a spear. You have the tip of the spear where the arrowhead the spearhead is. And then there's a long kind of shaft. The, the, the shaft of the spear are the products and services and the people who develop those things. Designers have always been farther down the shaft, right? The people who are business strategists, financial planners, um, you know, managing directors, C-suite people, they're on the tip of the spear where they're making decisions around the business that affect everything on the shaft of the spear. When you learn about brand strategy and start to learn the nomenclature and the vocabulary and the, and the thought processes that go into this sort of thing, you are moving up the spear. You are moving towards the, the tip of the spear where you start to being able to interact with the people who are making all the decisions that affect everything down 
the spear. To the tip. Yeah. So the closer I love the analogy. To the, yeah, the closer to the point that you come, the more effect and the more power you have over all of the other decisions that come and happen in a company. So by your learning, you, Omar, learning brand strategy and that vocabulary and how to communicate and understand those precepts, those concepts, you become a partner to your business partner, a true partner, because you're able to really kind of think about and process and make decisions around things on a much more strategic level than just like, what color am I going to have our color palette be, or what fonts are we going to use, or what's our photo style, right? Or yep, what's our design absolutely. layout going to look like? You can say, let's talk about these things strategically. And here's the other thing. When you operate on a strategic level, that dictates what your creative is. That's strategic design, not just aesthetic design. Yeah. Those absolutely. are two very different things. You can make a logo, you know, if you, if you just, you get hired by a client to do a logo and they go, you know, I like unicorns and I like purple, right? <laughs> and so you will design them a unicorn logo in using purple, right? And whether they like that unicorn or that color or whatever it is, is purely subjective for them. But if you really talk about it in a strategic way, what's your product? What's your service? Who's your customer avatar? Those answers are what's going to dictate actually what your design decisions are. Maybe Absolutely. your customers aren't expecting purple. Maybe your customers don't like unicorns. Maybe they're not. That is, that's You may, Mr. Client guy, like unicorns and purple. But if you're selling this particular product and service to this particular customer avatar, they're not expecting purple unicorns, right? They're expecting something completely different. And that's what should be driving the design decisions. So that's the other piece of it is that creative pros who learn about brand strategy are upping the level and the quality of the design work they're delivering. And they're taking the, the subjective decision-making out of it. And it becomes an objective decision-making process. Yeah, totally, uh, Philip. I mean, I, we're coming towards the end of the session now. And I, I just have to just take a moment to say that the value that you've given on this podcast has been immense. It's just really awesome to hear it from, firsthand from yourself, uh, you know, the the ins and outs of not only just creating content and the intention behind content, but also the brand strategy around it and why that's important. Um, we're really excited about your course. I'm glad that you brought it up on this podcast. So we'll definitely uh, follow up with you on the course, course and when it once it gets released, we'd love to share it out with the community if you're happy with that. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is the last part of this discussion. Just, just want to touch on one last thing before we do end the call. Um, you, you know, we're talking about brand strategy and we mentioned that it will guide, brand strategy will guide the true deliverables targeted at the, uh, actual audience uh, type right, or the audience profile. Now, considering that, you know, I have, I've been in this position where I've, I've come across a lot of creative professionals and they've been sold this dream of brand strategy. Like if you become a strategist, you can position yourself higher. You can say like, as you, as you put it, you can push down the length of the arrow and come to the end and make more high level decisions. All that, that, that sounds dreamy for, an, for, 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 a, for a designer that wants to be positioned in that way uh, and be taken um, more seriously in the business and corporate environment. Now, however, I've seen people adopt strategy, but they don't have craft, you know, um, or they haven't worked on their craft enough, you know, so they'll formulate a great strategy behind it. And all of that is sound. But then when it comes to actually putting the pen to the paper, the work isn't there. The, 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 the you know, it doesn't, it, 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 it just feels underwhelming, you know? Uh, I've heard, I've seen it, and I've also had people complain to me about it. That look, I've, I've, I've done all the steps, but the clients are not digging what I'm doing, or n near, neither is the audience. And the issue that I see there is craft. They just haven't had enough experience in craft. So, what's your advice there? Would you, I mean, you know, for creatives that are looking at strategy before craft, is, is that a problem? Do you think? Uh, is it a problem? I think that people work on their craft their entire career. You know, um, there are people who are innately talented in design. There are people who struggle with it and really have to, you know, hit the hammer a bunch of times to get something to come out that looks halfway decent. There are people who are brilliant strategists and very um, analytical thinkers who that comes very natural to. There are creatives and designers who struggle to put two words together or to really articulate 
business concepts, especially when they're earlier in their career and they don't really understand it that well. I personally feel like it's, it's always going to be an ongoing iterative process and you will find over time what you are strongest at and you will leverage and push to, uh, to, to, to develop that to its fullest capability. Not yeah. everybody can be a perfect generalist. Not everyone can be a brilliant brand strategist and an excellent designer and the same time. Know, a yeah. great video editor and an incredible content producer. You know, we all have strengths and towering strengths and 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 lesser strengths in all sorts of different areas. So should you work if you're a creative professional designer, should you work on your craft before you develop Strategy. Any kind of understanding strategy. I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say you should concentrate entirely on your craft and then suddenly go, okay, now I'm great as a designer. I'm going to start lear learning about this thing because you're going to be doing a, yourself a disservice. And I actually find that there are a lot of designers out there who, you know, I'm just going to say it can be very, can be prima donnas about aesthetics that they have a very high-minded idea of what design aesthetics are right and what is wrong. Right. And if you concentrate entirely on your craft, you become myopic. You have you become a horse that has blinders on and you're not seeing the whole picture. So I think that develop as the sooner you can develop an understanding of business and strategy, the more it will positively affect your growth and your craft. That's but very interesting. You, but if you don't, but if you turn your back on it and concentrate entirely on your craft, you're doing yourself a disservice because you're not really looking at the whole picture of what design is. Design is not art. Design is art with a job to do. Yeah. Design has to make people do something. And so you have to understand about the making people do something part as much as you do around the design part. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I really appreciate um, you know your viewpoint on that, and it it makes total sense. In fact, and I can totally understand that you know don't procrastinate on learning the business side because you're going to need it as a creative professional, uh, in, in especially in the current times that we live in with the digital. And age you will current. advance faster in your career if you know it. Absolutely. The more you start talking at this level, even earlier in your career, the fastest you, the faster you will move up the ladder. Yeah, I love how you positioned how strategy, whilst working on craft, can almost like symbiotically fuel one another, and you know have um, can can grow each other uh, on the on the same level, which is which is awesome. And I totally agree with you there. Um, Philip, it's been really awesome having you on the podcast. Really, really appreciate that you've taken your time uh, uh, to, to come on the path to glory. It's been truly, truly glorious uh, having you on board. And yeah, man, we'll catch up with you soon. Once you have released your, um, your course, uh, we'd love to hear more about that. And uh, yeah, just tell us where we can find out more about you. You know, we know you live on YouTube, but there's also the newsletter and other stuff. Can you tell yeah. us, guide us around that, please? Yeah, if you go to Philip, if you know my URL, it's my name, philipvandusen.com. You can find a place to sign up for my newsletter and that puts you on my email list. I'm not going to spam you all the time, but if you get on my email list, you will get alerted to when my course go live, which, which is in just a few weeks, you'll start getting the emails about it. So I encourage you to go to philipvandusen.com and uh, sign up for my newsletter. And you will get on the list and you will start hearing about the course. The one other place I would recommend that people go where you'll also, where I go live all the time and there's a big community of creative professionals is the Brand Design Masters Facebook group. So Brand Design Masters on Facebook group. It's a private group. You have to answer a couple questions to get in. Um, but it's a really great, vibrant community of creative, creative professionals. And I hang out there a lot and go live in there. Um, outside of what I do on YouTube. So if you want some more Philip time, show up there too. Yeah, sounds great, Philip. There you have it, guys. So there you go, Glorify is really, it's been a really awesome session. And I think a lot of the content that we spoke about today is, you know, I think goes globally for any type of business that you're running. Um, you know, whether you're creating content and you need to define a specific brand around, brand identity around that content, 
all the stuff that 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 we've spoke about here is going to be truly truly a game changer for you and follow philip check out um you know uh, check out the, the links that we drop down in the video make sure you sub- share and subscribe uh to the podcast and yeah we'll catch up with you guys soon stay glorious take care bye <laughs>